Day 29 after the Genshin Impact Final Closed Beta. It's been a really rough week, waking up in the morning, turning on my PS4, just to realize again that the beta is over. I've been having dreams of hitting Adventure Rank 50 and one-shotting the Storm Terror with the non-charged arrow with Amber. He would damage me with his Wind Breath attack, but my wounds heal faster than he can make them. It feels so good. I feel so much power. I feel like I can be the next god after Barbato- <coughs> <coughs> Uh, yo, uh, what is going on guys, it's Sage here, and welcome to part 2. In the first part, we discussed about the map, the world, even though just a little bit since I don't want to spoil anything to the ones who have not seen or had the chance to play in the beta, and the settings, and also the UI. Now, let's get to the juice of the game, shall we? Seeing as this is a miHoYo game, the characters, or Valkyries in Honkai, are one of the more important aspects in the game. The core gameplay in Honkai is to combo your Valks with other Valks. People tend to have a main DPS, a support, and a Valk whose purpose is to trigger a QTE to then switch to your main DPS. For example, I would use God Kiana as a main DPS, Teresa's Celestial Him as the support, and Bronya's Drive Cometa as the QTE trigger. There are metas in this game, but I don't see how it's even necessary to think about it, except if you want to get number one in the leaderboards. But how does that tie in with Genshin? Well, honestly it doesn't. The fluidity and how the devs want the game to be played are almost entirely different. You can't just switch in a character and immediately press attack and it'll auto like it does in Honkai. In Genshin, you want to have characters with elements that complement each other. What do I mean by that? Take your character for example, the Traveler. Your first available element is Wind or Animo. It is the most flexible element in the game because it complements or boosts other elements to mix with your element. For example, if you use Amber's Charged Arrow Shot, which deals pyro damage to an enemy or even your surroundings like the grass, they will catch on fire. Of course, just letting them burn is enough to deal damage to them, but what if you want a bit more, uh, I don't know. <laughs> By looking at the indicators above the enemy's heads, it'll show which element they're currently debuffed with. Of course, in this example, it was Pyro, so there will be a fire logo above their heads. This is where your character with the animal element comes in. By using your main skill, you can enhance the effects of the burn. And because your skill ends with a small gust of explosion, it'll mix in with the fire causing, well, an explosion. Not only that, but the game has actual elemental reactions. Meaning, enemies that are burning will get vaporized if you deal hydro damage. If they're debuffed with hydro, you can electrocharge them by applying electro damage. The same goes to if you want to cancel an effect. Say the enemy is burning, you can apply cryo damage in order to extinguish the fire damage. Probably the two strongest elements in the game for dealing massive amounts of damage are Animo and Pyro because you can pretty much mix them and combo with almost every element in the game. I should have said this earlier, but there are a total of 7 elements. Animo, which is wind or air. Pyro, which is fire. Hydro, which is water. Geo, which is earth. Cryo, which is ice. Electro, which is... I mean, Electro, and Dendro. Now, I'm not sure what Dendro really is, but looking at the logo of it, I assume it's like the support type. This also ties in with what I want to give as a feedback though. In Honkai, if you go to your phone, there's the instructions option, which gives you a variety of things to look at, like how to trigger a QTE or how to get more crystals, and there's also the Valkyrie database, where it describes each Valkyrie very well. Now don't get me wrong, Genshin does have that as well, but it's not accessible after the tutorial parts of the quests you get in the first few hours of the game. If we could have like a glossary of all the elements or how it reacts, it would be pretty neat and it will help a lot of people. Anyway, the combat system itself is honestly not that groundbreaking. Basic attacks are pretty dull in my opinion since it feels slow and not very hard hitting until you get to high enough level where you see your damage reach around 100 plus. Charge attacks also feel anticlimactic. Let me give you an example. This is Yai Sakura. Her attacks will apply Sakura brands to the enemies. Those pink things? Yeah, those are the Sakura brands. Now, whenever you hold the attack to perform a charge attack onto an enemy with a Sakura brand, this would happen. Yeah, see the difference in the hard hitting part that I said there? I get that they want to go in a different direction from Honkai, but I just want to point that out for some people who maybe cares about these kinds of small details like myself. 
It took me quite a while to finally adjust how I would play this game, since on Honkai, you wouldn't constantly switch from one character to another and just attack normally. Now that I think about it, a post-Honkai Odyssey has this type of basic attack as well. So for those who can and want to know how it feels like, I suggest try and play that map in Honkai. While we're still on the topic of the combat system, I have to address the good things and the bad things of it. Mostly the bad things though. But again, do keep in mind these are all in the beta and it's subject to change. Anyway. I have to get this out of my system quick, and that is the auto-mantling is annoying. I can't stress this enough, why am I mantling over things just because I'm close to it? They either need to tone down the range of it, or give us the option to disable it entirely. On top of that, the targeting system is very bad. I don't really understand why and how they messed this up to be honest. Again, I'm gonna use Honkai as an example. In Honkai, you have the option to change how you target the enemies by changing the camera lock on settings with free, normal, and auto. What I personally use is normal because you can easily change which enemy you want to target just by directing your joystick towards that said enemy. And when I played the beta, I thought that was somehow implemented, but I guess the team that worked on Genshin and also the engine itself is different. Feels bad, man. The way the enemy aggros towards you is also very weird. I've AFK'd a couple of times and, well, since I am AFK, I wasn't looking at my screen. But for some odd reason, enemies start to target me out of nowhere. And when I say nowhere, I really do mean nowhere. Like seriously, what even is that aggro distance? I didn't even know those hill trolls were there. And to top it all off, there's this one very annoying glitch in the game wherever you face the Mita trolls, which are the big ones with the shield. If your current element is Geo and you use the skill on them, they will reset and it's very, very annoying. Oh, nice! I glitched them! <laughs> you can't move! What? Dude, really dude, that's a, that's the dumbest glitch, dude, I swear. If you... Really dude? So yeah, that's uh, frustrating to watch. But what is it exactly that we are going up against in this game? Well, for starters, the first enemy that you encounter is a slime, specifically a hydro slime. There are various types of slimes, mainly just differs from what element they are, but one slime sorta of stands out from the rest, and that is the dendro slime. They creep up on you and if you see them, they'll immediately go inside the ground to hide from you. One of the ways to get them to go out is to hit them with a pyro attack. And since I don't have the luck to get Diluc from the gacha, I just use Amber's charge shot to get them out. Honestly, there's nothing really special about it, but it's just cute and interesting how they have this as one of the types of slimes we encounter. Next are the Hillishirls, which are like the cannon fodders for the Abyss Order, which are the main enemies of this game. The Hillichurls are like a species, whereas the Abyss Order is like a group of, uh, beings? There's also the Fadui, which are allies of the Knights of Avonius from Sidizinaya, the City of Ice. To be honest, I haven't read the manga at all, so I don't really know much about the lore of it. If you guys do want some lore stuff, I may be able to talk and discuss about it in the future, but for the time being, you can read the manga, which I'll be linking in the description. Okay. I'm gonna show you guys a clip from the first episode of my playthrough. Ooh, you can swim! That's cool. Oh! Don't, don't, I... Yes, I know, I'm so good at this game. Well, a few episodes in, there were a few updates that were rolled out to the testers. Not sure which update it was exactly, but this was one of the loading screens after those few updates. Yeah, I get it, miHoYo. Stamina is important in this game. Could have told me a lot sooner, but eh, it is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> like the loading screen said, stamina is used in almost every aspect of the game, from sprinting, charge attacks, climbing, swimming, and even for some reason, gliding. You start off with 100 stamina right off the bat. You might be thinking, "Oh, 100, that's enough." Right? Wrong. 
I can't tell you how many times I've died solely because of the stamina. You want to finish off that enemy right in front of you? Well, unlucky. Because you used your last bit of stamina to dodge its attacks, and now you can't use your charge attacks. Well, why didn't you use your elemental skill? Well, you know what? That's a pretty good question. I should have done that instead of trying to use a charge attack. But on a real though, if your stamina has depleted, I suggest just wait about 3-5 to five seconds until it fully fills up. You can just wait till it's half full, but there's no fault in taking your time waiting for your stamina to recharge and trying to think of a way to finish your opponent. Okay, then how am I supposed to increase my stamina? In order to increase it, you need to collect Animoculus. Or... Animoculi? What's the plural form of that? Okay, not important, I'm sorry. Anyway, they're scattered all over the world, and actually, someone had already made a map to indicate where each of them are. And for the Geo statues, you need the Geoculus? Bro, what are these names, honestly? Good thing is that if, say, your Animal statues are level 6, and your Geo statues are level 2, the amount of stamina you have doesn't change. The only thing that will be different is your skills. But of course, the more you play, the more you will need to unlock more statues. Not just to progress, but also for opening the map, getting adventure rank levels, and also flex to your friends that you've opened that one statue that's so far away very early in the game. There is one statue that stood out for me personally though, and that is this one right here. Now you might be thinking, how in the f am I supposed to get up there? Well, it's simple, really. First, you gotta go up this hill, then use your geo skill, climb up your geo skill, glide to this edge of the mountain, run past these ruin guards, climb this mountain, wait for your stamina to recharge, use your geo skill again, climb your geo skill again, climb this mountain, see if you climb the right mountain while enjoying the view, glide, climb, wait, and activate the statue. Even though some statues are harder to get to than others, the amount of adventure rank XP you get is the same. I feel like this should be altered a bit to compensate for the amount of effort you need to put into activating, let alone reaching some statues. Maybe just add a 25 or just a 50 XP difference would probably mean a lot. If you manage to activate a number of statues, you will get rewards for it in your adventurer's handbook. The handbook acts like an achievement system where it lists tasks for you to do, bosses that are available, and so on and so forth. Your daily commissions are also listed here, but you need to go to the city's Catherine in order to claim your daily rewards. Speaking of Catherine, she's your go-to for daily commission rewards, adventure rank rewards, and also expeditions. Expedition lets you choose one of your characters to go on a mission to collect certain items. While that character is away, you're unable to use them. For the other two, it's pretty self-explanatory. Anyway, the handbook also shows you your progress in the Spiral Abyss and shows the rewards for the daily domains, or dungeons. There are two types of domains, artifact domains, which gives you artifacts, and also weapon ascension domains which gives you specific materials for weapon ascensions, all of which cycles daily and you can see what each day will grant you by going to the domains and checking the reward details there. There is some sort of limit, however, on how many times you can tackle a domain. I said in the first part when I was talking about the map, you can see how much resins you have left. In this game, you use resins in order to claim most rewards. And by most, I mean claiming domain rewards and also Leline flower rewards. If you don't have enough resins, you can refill it by consuming a fragile resin, those crescent moons, which restores 60 resins. Also, bosses that are shown in the handbook have a cooldown in which they won't spawn until the cooldown is over. I think now's a good time to talk about how the quests work in this game. But Sage, aren't quests pretty self-explanatory? Well, yes, but no. Look, I just need a transition, okay? Quests are divided into four. Arken, which are the storyline or main quests, Story, which involves the characters in the Genshin universe. World, which are my personal favorite, quests that you get from the NPCs around the world. And lastly, Commissions, which are quests given from Catherine, who I've already talked about. While early quests don't require you to use certain things, some quests do use a few other features in the game. First one being the Elemental Site, which allows you to see certain things like footsteps and hidden texts on a rock that took me around 3 minutes to find. Honestly though, I would love to see this feature used in more than just certain quests, like say you need to use it to see a hidden entrance or a hidden key that leads to a treasure room while exploring, you know, stuff like that. In my playthrough, even in some quests where you're needed to use it, it seemed as though it wasn't necessary. I don't understand why, but I found the hint that I was supposed to find without using the elemental site and it just hit me. What was the purpose of this anyway? Is it just a niche feature added to the game, or do they actually have useful and specific things for this? I just don't want to see this feature to be overlooked when the potential for it is actually interesting. 
The second feature is pretty simple, but is very useful, time skipping. Honestly, when I first used it in the playthrough, it was pretty surprising, cause I didn't think time skipping was even implemented. Now, again, with this feature, the same argument can be used. Will this feature be useless, especially in the endgame? I will try and discuss endgame later, but yeah, stuff like this do matter in a game where it relies on replayability. Alright, with most of the features out of the way, let's discuss the leveling and equipments. First off, your character level and your level are two different things. You don't necessarily have a level, but rather an adventure rank. Adventure rank correlates to the world level. The higher your adventure rank, the higher your world level becomes. If you guys remember part 30 of my playthrough, the world level immediately increases right after I hit Adventure Rank 30, which in a way is a good thing, but not really. I was pretty lucky, cause I was just in a Hinochil camp and not say a boss setting where I'm pretty sure it'll boost their level significantly. I suggest making the world level increase after you claim your Adventure Rank rewards from Catherine because it'd be pretty terrifying to face an enemy that's your level, then suddenly their level is higher than yours without having the time to level up your characters. Of course you can pause the battle by going straight to your character's menu, but you would have to know this feature in advance in order to counter that sudden level increase. With the character levels, you need character XP materials. Weirdly enough, it feels as though you don't have enough sources for these except for Leeline God crops, which are the blue flowers. This becomes very apparent when you've hit world level 1 or adventure rank level 20. Yes, you start off at world level 0, in other words, the tutorial level. Anyway. Because you need more XP, getting the green ones which only gives you like 500 XP, it doesn't really help that much since you'd need tons of them to even increase one level. By doing and claiming Leeline outcrops, you can claim 10 XP materials every time. Again, the limit is only how many resins you have left. When you've hit the maximum level for that character, in order to advance higher, you need to ascend said character. In order to ascend, you need to tackle a specific character ascension domain, which in return, gives you the materials to ascend. For the early game, there are two main domains for it. Moving on to Constellation, which is like the skill tree for your character. It's uh, pretty annoying to upgrade in my opinion. With your own character, the Traveler is somewhat easy enough, but for the other characters, not so much. It's almost the same system as Honkai's, but the difference is, you don't need to collect fragments, rather you just need to get that specific character again in a gacha, which I mean, hey, muddy, am I right? Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like I agree with this. Rather, I actually disagree with this and I'm sure a lot of people do as well. Think about it, even when you're near max level but you just don't have the blessing from the RNG gods, then you might as well stop hoping to get that one material which you can only obtain by getting a duplicate in the gacha. I'd rather have them do a similar system like the old Honkai where you need to grind for advanced skill materials to upgrade your skills, and you just need time to do it and not luck. Now, I don't think that getting that specific material from duplicates is 100% a bad thing, but not having other sources is going to be the main problem in the long run. Since Genshin itself is a grindy game, even though of course there is still monetization in the shop and also the bonuses from the battle pass, having something to grind for will definitely help everyone and also the longevity of the game. Anyway, I remember there were talents, which are actually the skills that you can get from the constellation. Now, sadly, like a lot of people, I didn't quite know that the main point of it was for you to be able to upgrade your basic attacks and skills. Here, it shows you the talent info and also the attributes for that specific talent. The good thing is that you can get the materials for upgrading from domains and not duplicates like the constellation. Most of these can only be leveled up after ascension though, so do keep that in mind. Oh, also, constellations and talents differs depending which element you're using, meaning if you change from Animo to Geo, you'll have different leveled skills and damage. For weapons and artifacts, leveling up and ascending are pretty similar to how you would with your characters. For weapons, you use enhancement ores, which you can obtain from the chests around the world and also from quests. You can also forge them in the blacksmith, but that's not really recommended since you can forge weapons with those crystals. Speaking of forging, I would love for them to add or change the weapons that you can forge. Not really sure how that would work, but usually in these types of games, the blacksmith always has the exact same weapons even until endgame. So if it changes or they add more weapons other than the ones that were in the beta, that would be pretty neat. Artifacts come in sets of 5, a flower, feather, hourglass, cup, and a crown. Yes, I know they have official names, but who really remembers them other than the flower? Anyway, if you equip a full set, or a minimum of 4 pieces of a certain set, you'll gain stat bonuses. You can get an additional stat by upgrading an artifact to plus 4 or 4 times. 
I'm not gonna get into the details of the stats and every stat bonuses because of obvious reasons, but I'll link the wiki for the artifacts in the description below. Alright, how long is this? Uh, oh my, okay, well, uh, guess I'll end this part right here then. In the next part, I'll be discussing the co-op, a bit of the gacha system and shop, and a few other things in the game. If you guys enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like, that definitely helps me a lot, and also subscribe with the notifications on so you won't miss my next upload. And yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, thank you guys so much for watching, it's been Sage. Thank you so much for 400 subs. It's cheesy and overused, but I really do appreciate the support. My goal is 1,000 subscribers, so for those who have made it until this part of the video, comment a smiley face down below. Anyways, take care, have a great day, and I will see you guys later. Who are you today?